Hello and welcome to In the Envelope, an awards podcast. I am your host, Jack Smart, the awards editor at Backstage, your guide to the acting industry and the most trusted name in casting. In this very special bonus episode, we are presenting the best of the best acting advice, audition advice, career advice from the contenders of the 2017 Emmy race here in the middle of Emmy nominations week. This season of In the Envelope is brought to you by HBO. How are you? It's been a while. I'm good. It's been a I'm good. couple of weeks. Bit rained on. Some time off. I, we got rained on today. Um, How about you? I'm good. It's been a little mellow before. I mean, we're all ramping up for Emmy nominations. Yeah. Me and all of the the publicists and I'm sure all of the... TV actors and creators out there who are ramping up for July 13th, the big day. Seen all the ads in the papers. For your consideration ads? Yes, I have. They are everywhere. Yeah. That's a big part of it. In fact, we should have an episode later where we talk about that aspect of the industry and how FYC events and FYC branding and marketing and all that advertising stuff, that is just growing and growing every single year. Yeah. Especially for TV. Today's a bonus episode. It's a special, uh, we've never done this before. We're going to include a recap of some of the best advice we've heard, but we're also going to reveal never before heard audio from many of our interviewees who had brilliant, brilliant, brilliant stuff to say that we did not include in our in our previous episodes. And it killed me that we had to cut that from exactly. previous episodes. And that's why we're here today, because <laughs> we know that our listeners will really benefit from the extra advice that... Yeah. For example, Andrew Reynolds and Jay Duplass and Tandy Newton had. Mm. We asked uh, a lot of people what is great acting to them. We asked who's your favorite actor. Uh, but we also just asked for audition advice. And, and I've found when you ask an actor, how do you nail an audition? That advice is evergreen. You can take that to the yeah. bank. You yep. can walk into your next audition room and feel a lot more confident that you're going to get the job. And hey, feeling confident to get the job is a huge part of the puzzle. To and get we're getting job. advice from people who have booked huge gigs. Yes. Which is important. Indeed. You can get advice from a lot of people, but, you know, these are Emmy contenders. That's right. And and winners. We're talking about Claire Danes and Hank Zaria and, oh, Brian Cranston. Oh, yeah, that guy. Oh, yeah. Um, Jamie and I are very excited to finally uh, reveal to the world why Brian Cranston wanted to come on our podcast and talk to his fellow working actors. Mm. Uh, later in this episode, we will have the epic monologue he delivered about how he reconceived auditions in his head. It was He kind of framed it as the first step that he took to become a successful six-time Emmy Award winning actor. Yeah, it was a revelation he had just in a, in a right. flash of inspiration. <laughs> yeah, and he articulated it very well in our interview and we have saved it for today. And that's what today's bonus episode is all about. So let's get to it. First, we need to hear from our very first guest on our podcast, our very own Claire Danes, <laughs> three-time Emmy winner of Homeland. She had an excellent piece of advice on how to think about walking into the audition room. We don't have a studio as actors, you right. know, and turn it into your studio. Mm. It's just a place where you're working your thing out and you have an audience, which is, you know, helpful. Um, and there are some stakes, which is also helpful. Also helpful yeah. But that gives you, you know, an objective that's different from just booking the job. Mm. And that reads as confidence which is is also going to help you. Oh, very cool. Um, Reads as confidence, yeah. Yeah, and because it it is, it is. Right. you actually don't need them yeah. or the the gig. I mean, and um, so that would be my advice: is turn it turn it into an exercise. And you know, if you love it, you mm. get to do it, yeah. and it's not that consequential. Speaking of confidence, uh, one of our favorite guests on this show, Aubrey Plaza, has plenty of confidence to spare and is, in fact, such an oddball <laughs> and so unique in her career and in her craft that her audition advice speaks to her success and also to the success of any actor who's really looking to stand out. Just make, make a bold choice uh -huh. and, and don't, um, don't bail on it. Like, 
just make a big choice because I, I, I found, I found that people that are, that are, I've been on the other side of the table now, just as a producer and you can tell, or you just, I just know that people never know what they want until they see it. So you just have mm. to like make a big choice and completely commit to it and don't be scared. I think that would be my advice because yeah. I think so often people try to do what they think that the person would want and you just have to forget that completely and just just decide this is what I'm going to do and I don't care if they like it or not. And usually right. that'll get you to part that I don't care if they like it or not attitude. The I don't care if they like it or not attitude was something that we heard from a lot of our guests on this podcast in one form or another. David Harbour's version of that advice was to sometimes walk into the audition room with so much of a I don't care what they think attitude that you're even stepping on people's toes or being a little pushy. Um, I asked him about his early, the early days in his career when he used backstage a lot to find acting gigs. You bugged the public theater over and over again to <laughs> yeah. get a job, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't. I guess everybody's path is unique, and I don't. Uh-huh. I really don't know if what works for one person works for another. But I do know that if I rounded up all the people that I know who are very successful actors, mm. um, they we all have kind of one thing in common, and that's the idea that like. We all did crazy <laughs> shit. like like <laughs> the people are like, no, you didn't. Yeah, and they're like, yeah, I did. Like I went to that meeting yeah. and I just walked in and I started a monologue and people are like, what? <laughs> you didn't do that. You get arrested. And right? Like, yeah, I know. No, I actually did. <laughs> so I feel like that's yeah. the thing where you know I, it has to be your own version of that that's creative, <laughs> but I feel like. I feel like at the end of the day, as much as people hate it, they still kind of admire mm. it. That that kind of tenacity and that kind of need and that kind of hunger will take you a long way. It will take you a Excellent. lot further than being respectful and kind of sitting in your apartment waiting. Yeah. That won't take you anywhere. Waiting for the phone to ring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We would also be remiss if we did not revisit our spectacular interview with six-time Emmy nominee Elizabeth Moss who remembered the very best piece of audition advice she got from a certain prestigious filmmaker. I would say the number one piece of advice that I re- ever received was from mm. Jane Campion for Top of the Lake mm-hmm. for my audition. Um, I talked to her on the phone and she said to me, uh, don't worry about hitting the bullseye, just get the dart on the board. And mm-hmm. for me, that was the greatest, like, gift she could have given me because it sort of released any anxiety that I felt. I was still really nervous, but sure. it just made me feel like I wasn't, I wasn't trying to, I wasn't trying to win a Tony in that audition. I was just <laughs> trying to give an approximation, a sort of uh, a dart on the board of what the, what the character might be. And I think that um, without any rehearsal, without any talking to the director, without any like that that's the best you can do you know and i think there's something about that advice that also releases something in you and that mm. you relax a little bit and lets you not try to achieve some sort of idea of what you think they're looking for which they may not even be looking for that brings us to our very special brand new interview for today's bonus episode of in the envelope we spoke with casting director amanda lenker doyle Backstage has unique access to the other side of the casting table. We have plenty of connections with casting directors all over the country, uh, specifically those at the Casting Society of America, a wonderful organization that Amanda has been a part of for the 10 plus years that she's been working as a casting director in television. She has a really interesting perspective for working actors to hear because not only does she have plenty of audition advice, of course, for how to walk into the audition room and maximize your chances of booking the gig, she tells us what it is she does day to day and reveals that casting directors are not these cold, terrifying figures to fear when you walk into the audition room and try to put your best foot forward. They want you to succeed. She has plenty of advice for working actors Here it is, our interview with casting director, Amanda Lenker-Doyle.
what can you tell us about what it is you do? <laughs> I think listeners yeah. this podcast and, of course, readers of Backstage are always curious about what it is that a casting director does. Sure. Um, well, just for some clarity, I've been working in casting for 10 years now, almost 11. Um, I started a commercial in commercial casting um, and transitioned into theatrical casting in a, a, around 2009, um, where I started as an assistant um, and then worked my way up to a casting director. And I, um, I started it in the office of Bialy Thomas and Associates. Um, and my first pilot as an assistant was The Walking Dead and Detroit 187 with that office. And we were doing Lie to Me at the time and Terriers. And there's a lot going on. It was crazy. Um, and then I started working with Alexis Kazera and Christine Shevchenko, and I was with them for six and a half years. And with them, uh, we cast the pilot Blackish, and we worked on Fuller House and The Muppets for ABC and lots of other really fun shows. What does your schedule look like day to day? That's a really interesting question. So um, if we're in series on a show, um, we're basically getting the script for the week or for the, the following week that we'll shoot. Um, and we're always prepping a week ahead of uh, production and we'll break the roles down, uh, put a breakdown out and have sessions for all the roles, um, send our choices to producers and the producers will pick who they want to hire and we will send to the studio and network for approval. And, um, and then we'll hire the actors in series. Uh, pi- the pilot process is completely different. Right. It's a, usually a 10 week process. Um, and that's when we're hiring the series regulars for the show. And it's a little bit more, you know, we have more time to be more creative. We have more time to see more actors for those roles. Um, and uh, it happens over the course of, of, like I said, usually six to 10 weeks. Mm. Well, and you mentioned being more creative. And I think that's the part of being a casting director that actors are always eager to learn. Like, it's so hard to talk about because it's basically, it's you feeling out actors and assessing their their talent and their strength, right? But also there's just some intangible feelings about whether an actor is right for a role. Like, can you break it down to a science? What are the secrets of matching the character and the actor? Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting too, because you're right. It is, um, there is an intangible thing. It's kind of a feeling, you know, and it's, um, it's really just about understanding what your, what your producers and, and the creatives on the show are looking for in regard to that part and having an open mind, um, when, you know, selecting the, the, the people that you think could potentially be right for that part, because what's originally conceived isn't always what ends up, you know, working the best. So um, it's a combination of our, our knowledge of the, the pool of actors that we're working in, um, but also, uh, you know, getting a little bit creative in, um, in, you know, it's almost like matchmaking, I suppose, and, and pairing the right, person tonally with that character um and you know i i like to say that like they're everyone's not right for every part and i think that's that's a hard thing for actors to wrap their heads around um but it's it's just simply the case it's you're not going to be right for everything but you will be right for something someday um and that part is out there waiting for you you just have to be patient and uh and work really hard um, and keep at it because it will find you. Um, but the interesting thing is that some people work, uh, really well for something. And then somebody else comes in, who's a a, a complete gifted actor, super talented, but they just aren't, they just don't feel totally right for this particular part. Right. It's really interesting to, to watch. Yeah. Because it's not something that, um, and you don't, and we don't know until we try it. So we're always like, yeah, of course, let's try it. Let's see how it feels. Let's see what it looks like Um, in regard to a a specific actor. You know, we're open to trying it and you almost know immediately whether or not, um, even if it's outside the box, whether or not it works for that part. Right. Being not right, not quite right for a part does not necessarily mean that you're not a good actor, right? Not at all. (laughs) Not at all. I mean, people come in who we know are incredible actors and just 
just don't work in yeah. the role um, because, you know, and, and it's really about tone. Usually it's just who you are as a person. And I think it's so important to know who you are as a person, because all you can do is be who you are. And if who you are as a person isn't quite right for that role, that's okay. Mm. Because you, you can't play everything. I, I, it's really, it's just a really interesting thing. And it's hard to speak to because it, it is so, it's such a feeling. It's so intangible. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like a relationship with the creator producer is super important too. Like them communicating their vision to you and you then translating that. Like, it's almost like they ask you a question and you have to provide them answers. And is it safe to say that some creators and producers are better at communicating that than others? Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. You know, some, some writers and, and, uh, Producers are really specific about what they're looking for. They have a very clear vision of what they're looking for. And they um, they kind of, you know, are less open to different ideas in regard to the character because they're really kind of set in what they envisioned when they conceived the role. Um, while there are other producers who are, you know, we're, we're meeting on a project next week And the writer EP is like, listen, if I see somebody that does something totally different with with this role that I like, that I will just write to that person. And I will take that character in that direction, as opposed to like what I've conceived. I'm not married to, you know, where these characters are right now. I'm open to, you know, taking them in a different direction if the the right person comes through the door and they feel like they're right for this part. Mm -hmm. So it's a wide array of, of of people who are, you know, collaborating with us in different ways. You know, when, when we're approached by the writer that's open to anybody, um, we get to be really creative in who we bring in because, you know, we know these people can do this, this, and this, but this isn't necessarily on the page. Um, And if they're open to that, then that's really fun and exciting. And then the challenge on the other end of the spectrum is, is really having a very clear vision of what their vision is so that we can dig deep and find exactly what they're looking for in a person. I think it's important that, um, that actors are respectful of the writers, that they're respectful of the characters that they've conceived. Um, I'm, we're often asked, you know, can I improv? And some producers are super open to it. Some writers are super open to hearing, you know, their version, the actor's version of the the role. And some writers are really, really um, not open to it. They they really want to hear the words that they wrote and they want the actors to make the words that they wrote work. So uh, it's, it's a good question to ask casting. Um, it's a fair question. And if you, you know, haven't auditioned for this, uh, particular writer or producer before, um, you should definitely ask because it can make or break an audition, I think. Sure. Well, and I've asked many people about the audition process and I've heard from casting directors that the secret that many actors don't know and that they should know is that casting directors want you to win the, to win the part. So when an actor walks into the room, they can feel that they are providing a potential solution for these casting directors to, you know, find the right actor for the right part. And if you walk in Mm -hmm. knowing that casting directors want you to succeed rather than are sitting there bored or sitting there after the long, grueling day of hearing the same lines over and over again, is it true that actors should feel empowered to have that opportunity? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Listen, we want you to come in and do the best job of anybody all day so that we can show our producers an an amazing group of people that all nailed it. Like we want you to do well and succeed because it makes us look good. And it, 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 you know, it makes our lives and our jobs easier for you to come in and, and do your job well and with confidence and joy and, um, and walk out of the room knowing that you did your very best. And, you know, I've heard that a lot of offices aren't, are, can be like that, but um, in every office I've been in, we've always endeavored to make it a very comfortable and, um, you know, 
open space where actors feel safe and they feel like if, you know, they didn't, if they don't feel good about their performance, we're, you know, we're open to letting them do it again and again and again, as long as, as many, and, you know, we're putting everything on tape these days. So as many times as it takes to get the performance that you're comfortable with, but also at the same time, trust us when we say you did it, like you got it. That was great because there's a lot of um, insecurity. And I think if you can be, if you can just take a breath, be confident in yourself and calm and, and listen to us, we will not let you leave the room unless you gave us the very best performance that we know you could give us for that part. Yeah, that's wonderful advice. Is it safe to say that part of your job involves watching a lot of performances? Like how much of your job is watching TV? Oh, so much. I feel like I have to watch everything because <laughs> I, I need to be able to speak to it. You know what I mean? And I like to, uh, I want to absorb as many performances as I can so that I have a, you know, I, I feel like I have an understanding of, of all of the actors and who they are and what they do and what they, you know, what, who they are tonally and what they, you know, are capable of. Um, so I feel an, an intense pressure to absorb as much as I can. Um, I don't have a lot of time to, to watch as much as I'd like to watch, but I do, I do try to watch at least one episode of everything just so I can speak to um, the show tonally and have an understanding of the actors and what they're capable of and what they're doing on that particular show. I'm so thrilled to get to do what I do truly because I feel very lucky every day because that's how I spend. I spend my days watching incredible people do incredible work and I get to fall in love with people every day. And who doesn't want that? <laughs> yeah. You're in the business of falling in love. It's amazing. Right? Like, how incredible is that? How lucky am I? Yeah. Um, well, and you've sort of just answered this, but I've been asking everyone, what is great acting? But in your case, I'm wondering specifically about awards. What, in your mind, is what makes an Emmy-winning performance? That's interesting. I think... I think an Emmy winning performance is a performance that comes from a place of complete authenticity. I think if the performance is, it's so hard to describe, but I think the best performances are the most authentic and the ones that have the actors that have, have been able to strip away everything else to walk away from their lives, the rest of the, everything that's happening and just completely, uh, completely immerse themselves in these roles. I think those are the ones that, that come across as the most uh, incredible performances. So it's, it's the most authentic performance. Okay. That's the one that's going to, that's going to win itself an Emmy. That's awesome. Um, well, gosh, thank you so much, Amanda. This has been wonderful. Um, do you have any last parting advice for backstage users, backstage listeners of in the envelope? Sure. Um, again, I think just remember to take a breath, um, walk into that room with as much joy in your heart as you can, be as authentic as you can, and you know. I'm very lucky to get to do this every day. You're very lucky to get to do this every day. We we're living in a time that's rather difficult. So, you know, really embrace the joy in the um, ability to participate in this industry. And if you do that, you could win an Emmy. <laughs> if you do that, you could win an Emmy. <laughs> Excellent. Well, gosh, thank you so much. This has been uh, wonderful and keep up the great work thank you so much so nice to meet you and thanks for having me thank you Amanda for joining us wasn't that a refreshing new take on the audition process yeah absolutely actors I, think need to hear? I think we're breaking new ground by having a casting right. director on the show that's right um, casting directors I, I've found rarely get to share on a 
big platform what it is they do and try to articulate what it is they do, which is quite difficult to pinpoint why one actor gets a gig and why another actor that might be more perfect for the role doesn't get the gig. How you just know in your gut that one person is destined for greatness. Mm. Speaking of brilliant people, <laughs> Andrew Rannells uh, had so much amazing extra advice that we could not fit into our episode with him. Uh, he joined us in the studio and talked a lot about individuality and how you can embrace your uniqueness in order to book you the gig, how not to compare yourself to other actors. We need you guys to hear this. Our never-before-heard footage from Andrew Rannells. Keep it simple. Uh-huh. That's like, yeah, what I was so panicked about for starting on Girls was that I, you know, was coming mm-hmm. from this very broad Broadway musical. Mm-hmm. And I thought, I'm just going to look like a clown. Ah. I just can't. And I was given a great gift because Lena Dunham was directing that episode. Okay. And she allowed me, after the first couple takes, to watch the playback. Oh, okay. Which yeah. you don't get to do as an actor. And right. you shouldn't really do as an actor because it just makes you get in your head. But I think she knew that I could handle it. So oh, okay. I watched the playback and I was like, okay, take it down. Oh, take, take it, down. it down. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good to know. Shrink Good to it. know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, because you don't, you just have to think the thought. You don't have to like do much more than that mm. when the camera's all up in your grill. You think the thought. Laura Linney gave me a really great piece of advice as I was leaving the Book of Mormon, and I was about to do the pilot of the New Normal. And I guess mm. I, was, no, it was before Girls even. I guess so it was maybe right when we opened. And she said, you know, on stage when it's supposed to snow. You uh-huh. have to like pretend that it's snowing, and uh-huh. there's like a you know. But in a movie or in a TV show, when it snows, they just make it snow. <laughs> so you just have to be it's there. It's all magic. You just like have that's to be it. There. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to like do any sort of. Oh, oh it's snowing. Um, it's just <laughs> snowing. So just relax. That's excellent. Yeah. So just relax. Yeah. yeah relax. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to tell backstage readers, backstage users? You've been in their position. You know who they are. I mean, it's a it's a long game, my friends, mm. and I think that the the downfall or the some of the certainly the mistake I made early on was not keeping my eyes on my own paper um, mm. and constantly trying to compete with others, and it's a, just a losing mm. game. Yeah. So you really just have to compete with yourself and like just don't get jealous of what somebody else has mm-hmm. or somebody else is doing. It's okay to be inspired by it. Sure. It's okay to be encouraged or um, have that sort of motivate you to uh-huh. your next level. But um, I spent a lot of time being pissed about what other people had yeah. and it just didn't serve me. And it wasn't until I just stopped and I was like, I can only do what I do. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not going to try to do what anybody else is doing. Yeah. I'm just going to stick with my thing. And it's, I mean, no coincidence that that's when I met Trey Parker. Amazing. And I mean, because I I walked into that audition and just thought, well, it's just, I can only do what I do. Yeah. So I hope you like it. (laughs) Yeah. And if you bring that energy into the room of, of you got to cut other people down in order to feel better about yourself. There's a, people smell desperation. Sure. Oh, and yeah. Oh, yeah. I was certainly guilty of it and probably still am. <laughs> no. Let's be honest. Well, it's a occasionally. It's an, it's an evolving process being an actor and it is. taking on different roles and Yeah. And I think that, you know, for anybody starting out too that you know, obviously, you know, using using backstage and using their the the tools and the information that they give you, I think Excellent. is the is key to just sort of staying motivated and mm. staying there's I mean again like the the ritual of of getting the backstage on Thursday does it still come out on Thursday it does indeed it does um that meant something to me yeah. as a young person cool. to like go and buy it and go through it and look and like learn about what people are what shows are happening yeah what's being cast who's being cast mm. like you have to stay up on all of that mm-hmm. we also spoke to Jay Duplass of Transparent, but also, more significantly, of his many films that he has written, directed, produced. He has been on the other side of the casting table much more than he's been an actor. Even though he is now more known for being an actor, he had plenty of advice, which we could not fit into our regular episode, about 
how to walk into the audition room with just the right attitude. What is your number one piece of audition advice for those trying don't to give a sh oh <laughs> don't don't care at all. <laughs> okay. Don't care about what they want. Okay, cool. Uh-huh. Which is the opposite of what everyone is doing. But yeah, my advice <laughs> is um look. There have been people who have come into our audition rooms and torn up an audition and they have not gotten the role hmm. because they don't fit in the box. Uh huh. Uh huh. But I can promise you that we have worked with that person later down the line. Cool. When somebody, you know, when, when they come in a room and lightning strikes because they are so inspired and Mm. full of life to like play this thing that they are into. Um, that is what I think everyone is looking for. Um, and uh, so I'm mostly speaking in t- from a writer director perspective, mm-hmm. but that being said too, like I've, because I remember that, I mean like the few times that I've gone on tape, mm-hmm. I I've gotten the role be- and I've haven't necessarily done what they think they want. I've just, like made myself happy and fulfilled, I guess. Right. I don't know. I, yeah. I don't want to sound like I'm bragging or something or whatever, but it's just like, <laughs> no. I I feel like I'm lucky to have, look, I did, I made terrible movies for 10 years. It took me forever to get where <laughs> I was going, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's more from that perspective that I understand this. Sure. And you got to persevere. Got to, per- oh yeah, you got to persevere because... The other thing too is like what you think you may be good at or best at or best used for mm. might not be the case. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. There are, there are some people, I mean, that's another thing too is like I've had to come to terms with the fact that like um, I can be funny, but I'm not really a funny person mm. off the bat. Like, and honestly, the stuff that I'm doing on Transparent is very heavily dramatic. You know, sure. uh, yeah. and there's some funny pops here and there, no doubt about it. And, yeah. you know, but it is more about, and I never thought that either. Like if you told me five years ago that I'd be a dramatic actor, like a lot of the stuff <laughs> that I'm getting now is dramatic yeah. stuff. I, it's just so, it's so foreign to me, that idea. Um, so, you know, be open to, to what other people want from you. One of our guests on the show had such brilliant career advice that we actually, we have to revisit it because Tandy Newton was asked, you know, what is her number one piece of advice for working actors today? And her point that you should get out there and start to make your own work is, I think, a crucial one because you can, yes, auditioning is a huge part of it. And a lot of that is putting your fate into someone else's hands, but writing your own stuff and filming your own stuff. And as she says, there's plenty of resources out there to capture your own performances on film or to practice in front of an audience. All of that stuff is going to work your artistic muscles and going to give you more ownership over what it is you do, who it is you are. Here it is again, the brilliant acting and audition advice from the one and only Tandy Newton. I mean, getting into the room is everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and nowadays, because of social media, we've, it's a whole new frontier. And I would honestly say that if you have a lust for creativity, just start doing it at home. Um, write, mm-hmm. get your friends together, get your I- iPhones and start filming. If you can save up a bit of money to get an editing, bit of editing, an editing app, use mm-hmm. it. It's a whole new frontier and, and, you know, people have access now to the tools that can make movies. Mm-hmm. If, that's, if that's what you like, if it's, if you want to perform and, and you want an audience, busk, get out there, do it in sure. front of people. Mm-hmm. Um, write to people that you love. I, I heard this wonderful story the other night, one of the, pu- the puppeteers on Star Wars. He's mm-hmm. an amazing puppeteer. He's he's played some of the monsters in, in you know some of the creatures in lots of Star Wars movies. Mm. And when he was a kid, he wrote to the Jim Henson workshop um, uh, oh. and said, "I I want I want to be a puppeteer. How do I do it?" And they wrote back saying, "Well, you're only eleven. Um, <laughs> you're, you're you're too young. But when you're uh-huh. older, check back in with us." 
wow. and then when he was seven when he was like 17 years old he got a call from the Jim Henson workshop and they'd gone through the old letters because they oh, were looking wow. for applicants for a new program they were developing you know uh-huh. teaching kids and whatever and they found his letter and they said come on oh, come wow. on over and let's see what you've got and that's a true story so I think if you love something if you're really excited and animated by the mm. desire to be creative you mm-hmm. can't do that on your own you have to reach out to people so on the reach one out. hand create get people together who are like-minded learn the instruments save us money so you can get the apps that help you do that and write letters just don't yeah. stop writing letters emails you know you can go online google is an incredible search engine you can find the addresses of people write letters of appreciation about people's work. You know, Mm. I get letters every single day from people because they've appreciated Mm -hmm. work I've done or they ask advice. And sometimes I'll write back, you know, it depends what's going on. Um, Sure. But that's my advice is if you, if you're hungry, go eat. One last tidbit of advice from Tandy Newton that we did not include until now was a very specific very helpful and very, very frank piece of advice for actors walking into the audition room. And that is... If the director asks you to do something pervy, tell them to f*** off. That's right, actors. Tandy Newton has given you permission to shut down inappropriate behavior in the audition room. Unfortunately, it is a thing that can happen. And as Tandy says, tell them to f*** off. Well, Jamie, are we are we ready? Do we think? I think we've been hyping this think, long enough now. Do we think they're ready? Are they ready? No, I don't think they're ready. I don't think you guys are ready for the epic monologue from the master of audition advice himself. Uh, I think it's time for us to unleash the Kraken. The Cranston. <laughs> the Cranston! <laughs> That's right, here it is, folks. Uh, what you've all been waiting for. Uh, how to become a great actor, maybe even as great an actor as six-time Emmy Award winner, Brian Cranston. I want to talk to backstage. I want to talk to my my brothers and sisters of all ages who are, are performers, because if there's one thing, if there's just one thing that they would take away from my advice, it's this, and this changed my life about 25 years ago. And when I adopted this into my philosophy and approach to auditioning, I have I've worked more than ever before, and I'm much, much happier. And that is, the, I was basing the audition and my approach to it on a false premise. And the false premise is that I thought I was going to a job interview, which Uh, is sensible because you have someone who's casting for a television show or a play or a movie, and they're hiring actors. And uh, you're an actor, so you go in and you're vying for one of those roles. Mm -hmm. So everything points to this is a job interview. Well, what happens when you and um, every actor I know loves what they're doing, what happens when you go into a situation where you need or want something Mm. very badly is that you give up your power. You Mm. relinquish your power over to that situation. You can feel it. Now when I'm casting, when I'm directing or producing, I can feel when Mm. actors are reaching, needing, hungry, yeah. please, please give this to me. Mm. And with every actor who does that, uh, the person on the other side is less inclined to give them what they want, yeah. Yeah. what they need. Absolutely. Because it shows desperation, and we don't want to do that. Nobody, no actor is going to get a job out of desperation. It also can throw off your game. So what I realized is that 
I was making a mistake. I was going in there, giving up my power, giving up control because I needed affirmation. I needed approval. I needed a job. I needed or wanted something from them. So I just had this epiphany and just changed it in my head, the perception change, Mm -hmm. that I'm not going into that room to get a job. I'm going into that room to do a job. Mm -hmm. And that simple change allowed me to retain my power And to go in there and go, oh, so I'm just focusing on this character. uh, My job is to develop a compelling character that honors the text, Mm -hmm. that may be with a couple surprises that they didn't see, which takes a lot of work to develop and on your own or with a friend to develop those little moments, the little nuances that might surprise them. And to deliver the goods, I'm here to I'm here to act mm-hmm. and deliver something to you as a gift. And here's where it gets a little tricky, because <laughs> I tell actors you have to honor your ability and value your talent. Uh, mm-hmm. So it, it's it's a sense of quiet confidence that you come into the room, and I say quiet confidence because you are giving them a gift. If you value your talent the way you should and the way you need to, yeah, you need to know that you have a gift. You're helping them with a problem that they have, and then you're giving them a possible option. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Here, I'm giving you something that you might be able to use. Here it is. I've thought about this a lot. I've worked on it. It's my talent. It's my energy. It's my input. There you go, and I'm leaving it for you. And now I'm going. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> and leave. The energy is completely different. Totally. You are there to give them something, not to get something from them. You are there to give them a present, not to get a present. Yeah. And so that's why I say just within the acting circles, it's quiet confidence. Because if you if, if I said that out to the civilian population and said uh-huh. you are there to give them your gift. <laughs> there, there will be a lot of people who go, what arrogance, what conceit. Well, right. that's just awful. Right. Uh, those self-centered actors. <laughs> this is for us. And, and it's only for us to know. So keep it to yourself and your friends who are actors and say, this is what we need to strive for. Yeah. Retaining your power and your strength. And you give them your gift in quiet confidence, not chest beating, not arrogance, mm. not loud mouth, because here it is. That quiet confidence is going to read. I'm going to feel that when you come into the room. Mm-hmm. You couple that with your work that you put into it and your talent, and you're in a good position. Yeah. Finally, the, the, the last thing I'll need to say, is you cannot connect success with an outcome that is not your choice. You oh. cannot connect your success with an outcome that is not your choice. Hmm. You are there to do a job, do the job and leave. In the postmortem, when you're thinking about your audition, and everybody does, I call it the subway audition. You know, you're in the, you're sitting in the subway uh, going back home and you're going, uh, da, 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 da. Um, <laughs> and you, and you should, you should reflect on it. Yeah. Look back and ask yourself, did I do everything that I wanted to do? Mm-hmm. And if you did, that's your success. Yeah, yeah. That's it. And, and you let it go. Up. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Well, and it's the same true for for roles that you perform and execute. And do you also have that subway version where you're you're done with an episode of a TV show or you're done with a performance of a show and you you think, oh, I could have done that or oh, I should have done that. Like, do you go through that self critical process? Sure. But it's it's good to be self critical. Absolutely. Because yeah. what we want to do as performers is to raise the bar of our own expectations mm-hmm. to a high level and sure. then meet it. If you only give yourself a low bar to step over, well, oh, that's easy. Anybody can do that. Yeah. So in, in evaluating what your performance was in an honest way, mm-hmm. um, it's good. It's good to say, or boy, I, I was kind of, I've been under the weather and I've, it's been hard for me to concentrate. Uh-huh. Okay, that's a legitimate thing. 
Yeah. yeah. Or I've just had so many personal things happening to me. I feel bombarded by them and I was not able to yeah. clearly focus. Yeah. Okay. As long as it's not an excuse, as long as it's real, right. then give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Forgive yourself for a missed uh, audition and yeah. move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And know that you're not alone. You heard it from the master, actors. Uh, you are not alone. We are here for you. We here at Backstage and here at In the Envelope uh, are here for you, and we're rooting for you. And Brian's here for you as well. Brian Cranston is rooting for you specifically. Yes, you, listener. Um, we are also rooting for all of the guests who have joined us so far on In the Envelope. Uh, best of luck going into Emmy nominations. So after all these interviews... Uh What have you taken from this? What do you think it takes to become a great actor? What do I think it takes to become a great actor? Um, Yeah, you know, I've asked asked plenty of actors that question, and a lot of the great answers have been here on the podcast. I really like, you know, what David and Aubrey and Jay say about walking to the audition room with the kind of confidence where you don't care what the other person thinks. I think that's a very helpful attitude. I like Claire Danes' idea that the audition room can be a form of studio in order to practice. And Brian Cranston's idea was kind of going off of that of like, you're not walking into a room to get a job, you're walking into the room to do a job rather than need or beg for a job. But I also, I think that one of the most important things that separates an actor from a great actor for me is curiosity. Because if you are curious about stories and about human nature especially about yourself and other people, that is going to lead to the training. That's going to lead to working on your craft and your technique. And it's going to lead to researching and hearing a bunch of different stories and exposing yourself to a bunch of different art Mm. and getting out there and, and practicing your craft, whether that is in the audition room or, as Tandy Newton says, working on it on your own. And people have different forms of curiosity, like there's intellectual curiosity, there's academic, you know, there's trial and error curiosity. But I think what separates an actor who's just in it for the job or who's in it for the fame and an actor who's giving a truly great performance is someone who asks questions of themselves and of others. And that was so hippy-dippy mumbo-jumbo. But Hippy Dippy Mama Jumbo is, is kind of the name of the game when it comes to giving audition advice, as, as we've heard. Well, as Brian episode. said, you know, yeah. we're not talking to the general public, we're talking to actors. That's and right. it's a unique skill set and it's a unique world unto That's itself. Right. And uh, we thank you, listeners, for uh, coming with us on this journey and listening to our Mambo Jumbo. I think we should close this episode with even more brilliant advice from a certain Emmy Award winning actor named Hank Azaria who had a brilliant, brilliant thing to say specifically to backstage users. Let's close this episode with some excellent advice from Hank Azaria. I would say the last bit of uh, avuncular advice I would give Mm -hmm. is I think that making a show, I think there's three ingredients one must have. Mm -hmm. Uh, Talent, definitely. An almost absurdly, obsessively insane level of perseverance and persistence in the face of a crazy amount of rejection and no's uh, that you will face, definitely face. And uh, hard work, the willingness to work hard Mm -hmm. at your own craft. If you have all those things, there's almost no way you can't make it. You you won't need a break. You'll get many breaks. Mm -hmm. Many opportunities will present themselves. And if you can quit, if you're capable of quitting, you will quit and you should, and it's fine. You uh-huh. know, show business is very demand. It'll like, it'll really make it hard for you. Yeah. And if it's, if it's too much for you to the point where you need to do something else and that's completely appropriate. And mm-hmm. I also, you know, I, what I told myself when I was starting out was not so much I had to make it, but, but I regret never trying, you know, like what I had to do was try. Yeah. I didn't want to look back in my life and say, you know, I just wonder what would have happened if in my 20s I took a shot at that. Yeah, yeah. Um, huh. And, you know, I did, and it worked out well for me. I was really fortunate. 
But, you know, I would have been okay with uh, trying and failing. There's absolutely no shame in that. But the key is trying in the first place. That's the key. I remember I had a relative who kept always pointing out to me the odds. Like, listen, that only 0.001% of <laughs> actors ever make it. Mm-hmm. And I'd mm-hmm. say that's accurate, but guess what my odds are if I don't try? They're 0%. Okay. I've already, <laughs> I've increased my chances by 100% just by trying. <laughs> That's right. Don't forget to like, rate, subscribe, review, share in the envelope with actors and non-actors alike. Our podcast is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City. Thank you to Jamie Muffet, producer, editor, all-around podcast extraordinaire. You can follow him on Twitter at JamieMusicNYC. You can follow me, Jack Smart, at JackSmartWrites. And of course, Backstage, at Backstage. Head over to Backstage.com for more awards and industry coverage. Thank you, as always, to the team there, Peter Rappaport, Brian Rebstad, Jesse Balashak, Francis Ramos, Rowan Al-Khatib, and especially Casey Howe, who deserves an Emmy Award for being wonderful. Thanks for listening. Tune in next time for another glimpse in the envelope. Thank you also to our sponsor, HBO. Uh, but I've also heard that you're classing up the joint. Who? You. You. Oh, me? With your accent. <laughs> yes. Everyone says that. People are that. saying, yeah. Also, everyone who hasn't been to the UK thinks the UK <laughs> yeah. accent is classing. You. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're really, uh, you're really making me sound more legit. Me and my, like, American radio voice. Like, <laughs> Put on an American accent if you like. Yeah, could you? No. <gasps> <laughs> do you know what? It's an accent. Oh, my God, do it's it. It's so difficult and very few... Could you English do like a valley girl accent? Oh my god, no. <laughs> <laughs>